Welcome to a Healing Peace Podcast. My name is Kimir Baker. I am an overcomer. I am very passionate about helping others to achieve an abundant life fueled by spiritual principles and emotional balance. In this podcast series, we delve into spiritual self-care. Yes, we will explore exercising our minds and bodies, but more importantly, we will discuss strengthening our inner being, embracing God's love, and being filled by the fullness of God. As you take this journey with us, we want to inspire possessing your authentic selves and happiness. Nice to have you back. I hope you enjoyed our segment on loving ourselves. We will definitely talk about this very important element throughout the show. Until then, we press forward. For some, this has been an unprecedented season. Yes, ladies, we have gone through it. Despite the chaos, I know that God has showed up and showed out in my life. There were several areas of my life where his presence being full of grace assisted me in climbing over my hurdles. Last year, I interviewed a friend who shared how God also provided her with grace to overcome a very challenging time in her life. The items that she shared remains true for any season of our lives. Any season that requires God's grace and care over our spirits. Take a moment to listen to segments from podcast number 68, A New You, episode 30, Grace Over Fear, as she shares her story. One of the main reasons why I wanted Patty to join our show is that in 2019, she did have a lot on her plate. And I wanted her to give us an opportunity to share what she learned in that journey. So can you give us a little bit more background information of why 2019 was your toughest year yet? Yeah, I've gotten to the point where I love sharing about it because I think it gives glory to God more than anything. What happened was about four years ago, We knew our youngest son had walked away from God. He wasn't doing well. He was in college and he wasn't living with us. And we knew he wasn't doing great, but we didn't realize just how bad until one of his friends called us. And actually, it was while our son was on an airplane coming to visit us. We were having a family vacation together in Colorado. And this friend of his called actually my other son and told us that our younger son was using heroin. Mm -hmm. And I never in a million years thought I would have a child who used heroin that struggled to that degree. And I know that was naive on my part, but we had raised our children in the church. We had family devotionals. We took vacations together. We had dinner together pretty much every night. All of that kind of stuff. My husband would read the Bible with them every morning before school, all these things. And you just think if you just put the right things in your kid, it's like you're going to inoculate your kids against sin. And it just doesn't work that way. Right. And, oh, I had so much trouble wrapping my brain around that. So when he got there, of course, we had a family intervention. We talked him into going into rehab and all that. So within days, we had him in rehab. And we thought, okay, maybe this will be the end of it. But again, that was naive on my part. An opiate addiction is just one of the hardest things for people to overcome. Mm. And how it began was during college, my son played rugby. And I think certain people, they're wired to respond to opiates. I think it's almost like they can take it once and something switches over. They just love it. Mm. And it never occurred to me that my son would love him the way he did, but he had rugby injuries and they gave him opiates for that. And he loved the opiates and he got addicted. And what eventually happened, it got so expensive. A friend told him that, oh, you can take heroin and be high. It's for $10 for several days. And that started on heroin. 
And he thinks now maybe he had surgery his senior year of high school and they put him on opiates. He thinks maybe even his behavior changed then. I don't know. We had just talked about that recently. I'd always tied it back to the rugby injuries, but so he got hooked on heroin and somehow he still made it through college and got his degree and all that. But in the process, he was probably after rehab clean, I don't know, maybe a couple of months, but I don't think he truly dealt with the deep issues that caused his addiction until much later. And as a mom's perspective, what was so hard for me is just all the fears this led to. And being an addict puts you in touch with a very dark, dangerous side of the world that I had no experience with. To date, since Grant became a heroin addict, he's had 10 friends or acquaintances die. Another one has died. Even you heard me share this before, Kamir, just within the last couple of months. At the time, my son was living in another city. Every time I saw on my phone that someone was calling from that city, I mean, my heart would skip a beat. Mm -hmm. I would think, I'm getting the call. Grant's died. Something's happened here. And what happened is all these kids were dying either through ODing or suicide or even murder because of a drug deal that went bad. For him to lose, the most recent one was his best friend from college died from complications. It wasn't ODing, but complications from heroin use. And I learned at that point, I'm so grateful. I was open with other Christian women. This could have been really embarrassing, but when you get really desperate, you just don't care. And... (laughs) I was in a meeting of church leaders from all over the world. I mean, some of them I knew pretty well, not so much some of them. There were women from Africa who lead large churches over there that's meeting from the very first time. And someone asked us all, just as an icebreaker, I'm not sure they even expect us to open up this much, but I was feeling desperate. And I was at these meetings. I didn't care what was going on during the meetings. I was just afraid my son was going to die. He had a heroin addiction and he was going to die. And someone asked, so how's everyone doing in their faith? And I thought, well, I'll just tell you. And I tried not to take up all the time or verbally just barf all over the group. But I told him my son had an addiction and I'm just feeling fearful all the time that he's going to die. And a really good friend of mine, we hadn't talked that week, but in her time to God that week, she'd been reading this book, this devotional book. And in the book, she had read about we have to trust that no matter what happens, God will give us the grace we need in that moment. And that turned my life around. Because this friend and I had even talked before, what we would try to do in the past was you keep praying about something, pray about the worst case scenario ever and pray about that till you're okay with it. Something is this, I know it sounds (laughs) dumb, but when something is this awful, you're just never going to be okay with it until... God blesses with you in the moment with the grace you're going to need. I mean, I was never going to be able to work through and get to the point where I was going to be okay with my son dying. Right. I really was. I thought, okay, I'd kind of had this idea. There's a quote by C.S. Lewis, and I don't have it in front of me. I'm probably going to slaughter it. But something along the lines of, we don't worry if fear that God want what's best for us. We just fear how painful that best is going to be. Hmm. And that. That's been my faith issue my entire life. This was so helpful to realize, okay, quit it. I got to stop thinking, well, what if he dies? What if he can't take care of himself? What if he ends up living under a bridge? Whatever. I had to just quit it and trust God and live in the moment. Because one of my faith issues had always been, well, God didn't promise me that certain things aren't going to happen. He doesn't promise me my son couldn't die. How do I deal with it? And so I'd have all this fear. I thought all along, I've been asking the wrong questions. That what my focus needs to be is God will get me through it. And I got to keep my eyes on God. And from that point forward with the idea of Grant dying, it was a miracle from God. I really was able to just turn that off and quit what if it. And I felt like I was having so much more peace. Hmm. But then I started not too long after this, He came home specifically to get clean. And that actually made it a little easier because at least he was under our roof and I knew where he was and what he was doing most of the time, not all of the time. And we have a great relationship with him. I mean, 
that's one thing I'm grateful for about all the training I've had about how to be a parent and how to love that I've gotten from the Bible and from being in the church and that he had the relationship with us when he really wanted to change, he came home to do it. But just some of the things he was going through, even though he never fought with us, he was always loving and respectful for the most part. But he started exhibiting some really odd behaviors. And I started just really stressing out over weird things. Like my whole career working in ministry, I've done a whole lot of public speaking. I mean, it's like, it's what I do. I was on the inside having a little freak out every time I spoke. I would talk to my friends about it. And I think most of my friends were so blown away by some of the things I was dealing with at home. They couldn't see past that either. So finally, I thought I need professional help. And I started seeing a counselor. And she helped me see that if you don't deal with the root of your fears, that they just multiply like bunnies. And when I'm fearful about one thing, it comes out in other areas. And what was happening was because I had such a low level of stress going on at home and I didn't catch it. I was starting to what if again in smaller areas. Like one thing I didn't mention earlier, but I have systemic lupus and it's rare that I'm without symptoms. Usually I just don't feel very good. I was having to speak at a conference in Seattle. It was in the evening. Normally I try to speak in the mornings just because I feel better, but I was probably running a low-grade fever and the room was really cold and I started to shake uncontrollably while I was speaking. It went, the lesson ended up going fine, but everyone could tell I was shaking. I had to borrow someone's coat and it really bothered me. And the counselor helped me see that's what started it all. I started thinking before I was speaking at something, what if I get up there? I'm too sick to do this. Maybe I'm just getting too old to do this. What if I do that again and start shaking in front of a thousand people and there's not a coat I can borrow? What if I get up there and start shaking so bad I can't even talk? What if I do this? What if I do that? She helped me see I had to overcome that, that I had faulty patterns of thinking Mm -hmm. that it just made me think instead of trusting God, I was just always feeling like I was going to mess up something. And she helped me see where that had started and how I'd started doing that. And so I was really able to have some huge victories in that area. Highlight from podcast number 69, A New You, episode 31, God Over Fear. And so we were going to get it. My husband and I were speaking at a conference overseas. We had decided we wanted to take a few vacation days early so that we could adjust to the jet lag, all that kind of stuff before we started speaking at the conference. We didn't want to leave our son by himself. So we thought we'd take him with us for the first part. He'd be okay by himself for two or three days. You know, then we'd speak at the conference and come back home. And then he had decided that he was going to go back to rehab when we got back. So it sounded like a plan. So we get to the other country. Some things just are not adding up. And my husband searched my son's suitcase and we found all his drug paraphernalia and heroin. He had flown internationally with heroin. I can't believe he's not in prison somewhere that they didn't catch that. It just blew us away. So of course, we take all that away. We went and found a dumpster somewhere and put it in it. And it was just awful. We're supposed to be on vacation and speaking to hundreds of people in just a few days about God. And we're dealing with our son going through withdrawals the whole time we're on this trip. In the mornings, he's thrashing about, he's in pain, fever going up and down. It really is every bit as bad as you see in the movies. We would go out when we'd find times where he was sleeping and we felt like he didn't have to have us there. We'd go on long, long prayer walks and just cry. Mm -hmm. But it ended up, it ended up being a wonderful bonding time for my husband and I. It was even so faith building with God because we didn't feel great about our son flying back to the States by himself. But this is what was planned. We couldn't get his flight changed. We knew he'd be in a vulnerable state, but we're thinking, well, at least he's clean. He's going to rehab in a few days. And God got us through the conference. It went fantastic. Even given all the low level stress we had going on behind the scenes, I mean, we were very open about our son's heroin addiction. What we didn't want to get into was just, okay, he was going through withdrawals all the last few days while we've been here. It went great. I was very grateful to God for that. Well, when we got back, more came out. 
what happened? We picked us up from the airport. We knew something was wrong. He'd relapsed when he came back. And what happened? And this was the thing that rocked my world and made this the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my faith was all along, I prayed. Heroin can be difficult to get at times. An addict will always know how to get it. But sometimes for various reasons, their dealers arrested, whatever, an addict can have trouble finding it and have to develop new connections. So I prayed, God, okay, I know you don't take away free will, but please, if he wants to use, please just remove his ability to get it. Please make it where he just can't find it. What came out later, and we didn't know this at the time, was that when he first came home to get clean, he would be out in the front yard and he developed a smoking habit when he was in rehab. And I wasn't thrilled about that either, but you pick your battles. And so he'd be out in the front yard. He knew not to smoke in the house. And sometimes he'd be smoking a cigarette. Well, a kid across the street came over and would talk to him, a college-aged kid. And I thought, oh, that's awesome. He's making a friend. I thought, well, let's have the whole family over for dinner. We'll reach out to him. And there was always some reason why they couldn't come. And we live in a decent middle-class subdivision. Well, what we finally learned was this kid across the street was a heroin dealer. And after I had prayed all this, God, just make it where he can't get it. Heroin had been brought to our doorstep. And this isn't right. And I'll get to that in a minute. But I felt so betrayed by God. And then what rocked my faith even more was we knew we're in another country and we're having to fly Grant home to be by himself for a couple of days. He gets back into the States and he finds out that this kid that he'd become friends with, who is his dealer, was going to have to go back to jail and committed suicide. So our son finds that out while he's all alone and at his most vulnerable. So he went on a huge bender, just did awful. When we realized what was really going on and what had happened, we confronted him and it was starting to get heated. And he said, he goes, I think maybe I know of a better rehab that I could go to. And I have a list out in the car. I got it from my psychiatrist. I'm like, oh, okay, sure. We can call other ones, whatever you think. He goes out and he just leaves. And he's never done anything that cruel before. I mean, he's just a different person he's using. And I was sure he was trying to commit suicide. And I was supposed to be going to a birthday lunch to celebrate my birthday. And I had to call and cancel because instead my husband and I were driving around trying to find our son because we thought he was trying to commit suicide. These were the worst couple of days of my life. Finally, he came back home wee hours of the morning. He'd called us beforehand and it's a long story what was going on, but he finally came back. Of course, we took his car keys. We're just trying to keep him safe until he can go to rehab. They were actually at a shuttle and they were going to come get him. It was in a different city. It was just horrible. I felt betrayed by God. Like the timing on all of this. Why did you let this happen? Why did you move a heroin dealer across the street from us? You knew Grant was coming home to get clean. And why did you do all of these things? Why did you allow it to unfold like this? And I felt like I was the clay and I was fighting with the creator. I just did not want to go through this. I did not want to be that mom. While he was high that week, he had taken a lighter. You do really weird things when you're high and he burned off his hair all on one side of his head. He pulled out his eyebrows, all these things. And I felt like when I watched him, and he was just acting awful because then he was going through withdrawals. He's in pain. Worst thing we'd ever gone through, especially in our relationship. Normally, he's sweet to his mama. This was just the worst thing ever. When I saw him walk out to go to the car, to go to rehab, I just thought, this isn't going to work. This is the end of my relationship with him. He's never going to overcome this. He's going to get kicked out of rehab. He's going to end up living under a bridge somewhere, and he will die, and I'm never going to see him again. That was how I felt in the moment. But it was amazing how God got me through it. I mean, Todd and I normally can hold each other's arms up in hard times. God has just blessed us with a marriage like that. But we were both hurting so bad, we couldn't even help each other. 
And I went to go see a friend and I'm so grateful I did. Someone else in the church and yeah, I know we're supposed to be leading the church, but I told her everything and she cried with me and she helped me remain. I was mad at God. I could never consciously remember being mad at God before. Like, why'd you let the heroin dealer live across the street? Why'd you put him there? And she reminded me this was not from God. She reminded me of James chapter one, where it talks about God doesn't tempt anyone and he can't be tempted that this was not from God, Mm -hmm. but that God gets us through it. And that really helped. I just needed to remember, okay, there's something here. God will help me. I started to feel better. I got an appointment, of course, with my counselor. I talked to her. And she's like, you got to remember, God has the bigger picture. And it wasn't just that he'd relapsed. It was more all the lies and betrayal that went along with that. It's amazing what God has taught us since. Even that day, I remember the counselor saying, sometimes I don't even know what I'm feeling. And she's like, you probably even feel stupid. I thought, yes, bingo. That's exactly what I feel. I was mad and I felt stupid. And she goes, why do you feel stupid? And I thought, it's because I was not born being good at knowing how to be a heroin addict's mother. Mm. <laughs> I thought that's so ridiculous. Right. It was good at that. Right. Who yeah. raised their hands to be trained in that area? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like we were drug testing and we knew a psychiatrist was drugged, but we thought we knew all the tricks. There was some new ones we did not know about that enabled him to pass those drug tests when he was not clean. But now I can see God was molding us. I mean, my son, from they're on blackout. That means they can't talk on the phone or have any outside contact the first week they're in rehab. But he kept having his counselor call us and tell us how sorry he was. And he got special permission to call me on my birthday, which I thought was so sweet. Mm -hmm. And just apologize again. And by then, I felt like I'd worked through things. And I'm so grateful. I have such a great biblical counselor. She was hard on me in a good way. She's like, you got to forgive every single bit of this because he's going to need you when he's done. And it's been so true. And I feel like I really have. If things hadn't been so awful and gotten so bad, we never would have kicked him out of the house. And he needed to get out of the house and go back to rehab. I think in some ways it was hurting his self-esteem so much he felt stuck. That was making him wanting to use even more. That here he is in his 20s and living with his parents. He was embarrassed and ashamed of that. We had to tell him you can't live at home anymore. In rehab, you're going to have to figure out what to do with yourself. We got a lot of advice on how to do that through the rehab, through the counseling there. He's doing probably the best I've ever seen him do spiritually. His whole life, whenever something's been hard, we're like, pray about it. And he goes, Mom, I finally feel like I understand that now. Mm -hmm. And I do it out of love for God. And I'm not just doing it because you tell me to. He's gotten out of rehab now. He's been living in a sober home. It's going fantastic. He's acting more normal, looks normal. He has been working odd jobs to make ends meet since he's been out. But just today, he's starting a career type job. He called us before on his way to work just this morning to pray with us about it. He's just really making progress. But I see God had to teach me so many lessons about trusting him, even when everything looks dark and horrible. Trusting and loving my son unconditionally. And I'm grateful for lessons God's teaching us at things that I'm ashamed to say this, but I will look down on before. And now I just have nothing but compassion. Sure. Now I got to have conviction about sin, but I have so much more compassion on all sorts of things and, and struggles and awful things people go through. So much more compassion than I did before. Yeah. And as you were sharing about the things that you went through with your son, there's a couple of things that you shared that reminded me of God with us because we tend to do things that are not necessarily the most helpful and can harm ourselves. But what you've shared, there's a couple of things that I'm like, oh man, that's God's character. And that is no matter what, he still wants to protect. Yes. Right. I hear that so much as you talk about your son that you still wanted to protect him. You still wanted the best for him. But then there was also a period where you had to make decisions to stop. And I'm going to use a strong word, but enabling. There's a point where it's like, no, you have to take responsibility for your actions. But in that responsibility, nowhere in what you shared do I hear, oh, I'm so frustrated. I don't love him anymore. 
Right. right. And there were times I was super frustrated, but I've been a Christian for a long time and I knew I had to battle through that. Right. And that's understandable because you're seeing someone that you care for hurt themselves in a manner that is like, is devastating. You know the long-term effects that this is going to have on your son. And again, when you were sharing this with us as a congregation, One of the things that really stood out the most for me was God still loves us and he wants the best for us. And hearing your pain for that was like, wow, that's God's pain for us when we were making these decisions. And in those decisions, we think that we're trying to comfort ourselves. We think we're trying to understand our circumstances, but of course it's causing more harm. And just hearing that wrestle, that paradigm of you're my child and you're causing more harm. And all I'm trying to do is still just love and protect you. Well, I think the thing I'm most grateful for is I've had my whole life deep faith issues. I couldn't put into words. I didn't even realize we're there. For example, I've always heard it said, you can't do anything to make God love you any more or any less. I've even said that at times, but I'm not sure deep down in my heart, I really believed it. But now I look at my other son and my son who struggled so much, and I can honestly say I don't love one more than the other. I'm so proud of my son with the heroin addiction for everything he's accomplished and overcoming here that it's helped me understand God's love for me so much more than I ever understood before. I feel like it's one of those special golden times in my relationships with God where he's just holding my hands and leading me along. It's the best it's ever been. My prayers are better than they've ever been. I'm learning new things about God. And the main thing is that he's always there for me, no matter what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And he always is going to be working things out, no matter what I see. But that's just hard to believe in the moment at times. Yeah. And I appreciate all the things that you shared up into that point in terms of wrestling through your disappointments, even wrestling with God when your prayers were not answered. I think what's so key in what you shared is that you still kept going to God, even though the circumstances did not look ideal. Yeah. I really do strongly believe that it takes courage, determination, and focus to continue to look to God that way and knowing that he's the only one that's going to give you that serenity and that peace, that healing that you need instead of walking away from him. Absolutely. And I appreciate your example in that way. And I hope to those who are listening that you heard that example and know that you can do it. It is accomplishable. In the darkest moments, you still have the capability of crying out and being with God and allowing him to work through that pain with you. Yes, absolutely. So I really do thank you for your time today and you being vulnerable and honest with your experiences with us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to share. Yes, thank you. As I said before, you guys enjoy the rest of your day and the week to come. Thanks for listening.